Okay, hello everybody. It's nice to see you back. And we're gonna get, have some really interesting talk by John Ledru. so welcome, John. Hello. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, I can see people are still wandering in and sitting down and things. Um, so to begin with, I, I just want to say I'm sorry, really. Um, so obviously you all came to this talk swearing, nudity, and other vulnerable positions. Um, you know, hands up, there probably won't be any actual nudity in the show. Um, so, uh, but we will have some improvisation. Um, in fact, you guys will be doing a little bit of improvisation later. Um, so if you do let yourselves go in that session, um, I would just recommend being aware of the people in your direct vicinity uh, before you take any of the words in the title, literally. So, my name's John LeDrew, and I've been in software for about two decades, and in that time I've done quite a lot of different things. Um, and back in October last year, well, it's been a year, <laughs> exactly now, um, I started a podcast called The Agile Path, and when I was doing that, I, um, all I really knew was that I wanted to do something that was creatively different from the other podcasts that were in the space, but I really had no idea what I wanted to talk about at all. I just knew I wanted to do something different, which is sometimes a good starting point. <laughs> and I ended up going, as it happened, that that month I went to Lean Agile Scotland 2016, and I literally just went up there with my microphone and just spoke to anyone. And I was just like, talk to me. Talk to me about what's important to you in Agile. Talk to me about why you do what you do. And it seemed that safety, this thing they called safety, was at least implicitly mentioned in almost every conversation, in almost every talk that I saw. It, it, people would say things like, oh, I could just see the team wasn't safe. And while I instinctively knew what they meant by that as a coach and as someone that had worked with teams, I knew what they meant, and I could imagine that, I was thinking, oh, I want to know a bit more about that. Why is that really important? Um, and I'd kind of, I'd probe them. I'd say, so, do you know, what do you really mean by that? What is safety? And they'd say, oh, you know, it's just the way they walk in the room, the way they hold each other, their body language, the way they look at each other, the way they talk to each other. I said, yeah, that's not enough. It, it was like safety was essential but enigmatic. It's like dark energy or dark matter, it was the thing that holds the whole universe together that nobody knows what the hell it is. So I left thinking that I had this really great topic. It, it seemed simple enough, kind of. It was confusing and it was a question mark, but it seemed like something that people hadn't explored in depth. Um, it seemed like a great idea, but as soon as I discovered <laughs> The, uh, the scale of the subject, like Alice, down the rabbit hole I fell. So I ended up speaking to many, many, many people. Um, some of these people are incredibly well known in the Agile community, and some of them um, were engineers and people I was working with in the team that I was coaching at the time. Um, but I wanted to get a really complete idea of what safety was and what that thing meant to um, individuals at any level, whether you're coaching or a team member or a manager. Um, I also started my own research, and that took me to a project called Project Aristotle, which is a Google, uh, a set of Google research. So who's heard of Project Aristotle here? Uh, good, a few hands. So Google wanted to find out what makes one team at Google amazing and another team not so much. Why is it that, that you get this differential? And they surmised it wasn't the obvious, that the hypothesis wasn't the obvious thing. The obvious thing being that team A has amazing people and team B, yeah, not so much. So they surmised this, that, that maybe, as Aristotle says, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Maybe this wasn't the main reason. So they started their research in 2012 
And over two years, they interviewed and worked with, I think, something around 1,500 people, about 180 teams, all the way across Google. Um, and they discovered that team effectiveness is actually less about who's on the team, but more about how the team actually worked together. So what actually makes the team great? So Google found five key indicators, and these indicators um, were what they found team members on teams that were effective were demonstrating. So let's go from the top in reverse order. So at the number one, or number five rather, we have impact. So impact is about knowing and feeling that you have, the work you're doing actually impacts the project and the organization that you're working for. Um, so this is knowing that your work actually matters. Um, if you start as an engineer at Facebook, any level, you will, um, you will be, you'll take part in a thing known as the developer boot camp. So this is an eight week program that all engineers and developers that start at Facebook do. Within the first couple of days, you will be putting code live. Some people will do this literally in their first you know, few hours in their job. Those individuals, those engineers feel impact immediately. The second they start, they know they are making an impact. Even if it's a small one, they know they're making an impact on the work. Um, in her book, The Progress Principle, by a lady called Teresa Armablay, she did a, a, a re research across knowledge worker teams in the States, um, a very large number of individuals. And what they did was, is every knowledge worker on these teams, and this is, when I say knowledge worker teams, I mean that generally. Some of these were software engineering teams, some of these were uh, physical engineering teams, industrial engineers, architects, etc. And what they did was they filled in a daily diary talking about the work they did every single day. So what did they do? How did they feel about the work they achieved? How were they collaborating? Was there, did they receive support from their management? And she sum summarizes this as the, the single most motivated individuals, the most engaged individuals, were the people that made regular progress on meaningful work. So these were the individuals that reported that every single day they had a small step, a small bit towards the project. They knew they were making projects, they knew where the goal was, and they knew that they were making even little steps towards that. But there's another half to that, which is meaningful work. So that takes us to number four, which is meaning. So in 1983, Steve Jobs enticed John Scully to leave PepsiCo and join Apple as their new CEO. And he rung him up and just said, hey, John, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to change the world? And what he was doing there was tapping into this deep-seated human need and desire to do meaningful work, to feel that what you're doing actually matters. And people often say to me, yeah, but you know, <laughs> my organization isn't alleviating the world of poverty or curing cancer or putting a desktop computer in every home. What does that mean to me? How, how does my organization, you know, how do my team find teams find meaning in what they're doing? But meaning is actually a very personal thing. This means that the work has personal meaning to you and it affects positively yourself or other people. And interestingly, one area that I see this um, most often is actually in um, is actually in teams where I'm working with pairing um, and encouraging teams to pair. So there is inherent additional meaning in the work when you're collaborating effectively and working with someone else closely and supporting one another. Um, there was a study done, I can't remember the date, but at Utah University. Um, into pairing, it was done by, well, completed by someone some of you might know, Alistair Coburn, in, as, as well as others. Um, and one of the interesting outputs from that, now there is a whole bunch of great stats on how much better the quality of the work was, and how better the, uh, you know, the, the lower defects, and all of those things. But also, 96% of the developers in that study said that they enjoyed the job more. And 95% said that they had 
greater confidence in their work. The meaning here came from the satisfaction of knowing that they were doing the best that they could do and also supporting their partner and supporting their pair. So number three, structure and clarity. Team members need to know what they're doing to be good at what they're doing. This should be fairly obvious, but it's very important for team members to know how they fit in the team, how their team fits within the organization, and how that team is contributing towards the goals of the organization, and not least knowing what all of those goals are. So could you, by a show of hands, I'd like you to raise your hand if you know what your organizational goal is, you know what your current project's goal is, and you know how you fit into that completely. You're really clear on that. Any show of hands? Okay, this is better. This is, you know what, this is getting better and better, which means every time I've done this, um, but I would say that's still well under half the room based on that show of hands. Um, and I've discovered that many people over-report this. <laughs> um, so uh, I've certainly found that many teams that I work with are not on the right page. They're not actually, um, they actually have very, 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 they're very unclear of all of those things. Um, and we'll get on to the last slide and I'll explain why people tend to say they know these things when maybe they are less sure than they might, might want to be. I imagine that, and I'm not going to assume this, but if you happen to be sat next to your CEO when they asked that question, your hand went right up. <laughs> so I have an exercise I do with teams where I will give them all a post-it note and say, I'd like to find out what your... Um, you know, what is the project goal or organizational goal or product goal, whatever the context of the, this particular um, session is, and um, go away in silence on your own, go and write this down, your best understanding of it. And I was working with a team a few years ago, eight individuals, and they all went away and they started writing, uh, and they give me the post-it notes and I stick them up on the board and sort of one at a time. Um, and after I did it, I was presented with eight question marks. It's actually the only time I've ever had full agreement <laughs> across the whole team. So, dependability. Hopefully, not the most surprising thing. But teams that get shit done regularly are considered better than the teams that don't. But there's a lot more to this, really, um, because the teams that are actually getting stuff done regularly, as, and that's what we refer to as external dependability, are actually also internally dependable. So that means that team members can depend upon one another internally to deliver upon their commitments. So this means that I know and I can trust that when Bob tells me that he, you know, he's working on something and he thinks he's going to get it done, um, that he'll do that. But there's actually a lot more to this, because this does not mean, <laughs> this does not mean that, that team members are all um, complaining to one another whenever they don't ship on time, because anyone in here, I imagine there's one or two engineers in the room, um, sometimes you hit a problem, sometimes you get stuck. This is just normal. This isn't anything to do with your um, individual dependability or your ability to deliver upon your commitments. Um, so actually, what it says here is that I can depend upon my team members to deliver or communicate to me when they get stuck. That's what's most important. So number one, we have psychological safety. Now what's interesting with this is that not only was psychological safety the most important element by a long way, they also discovered that it actually underpins the other four. So all of those other things which actually seem really indi individually critical to most teams, they weren't there when this wasn't there. And at Google at least, teams that didn't demonstrate levels, good levels of psychological safety were severely impaired. 
So why does this matter? We are all naturally, <laughs> which isn't very surprising, but we don't like to do things that could negatively affect other people's perception of us. So we don't like to do things that we think people will judge us for. So it tends to be around these three areas, which is competence, awareness, and positivity. So competence, do you feel that you can ask for help when you need it without being judged on your competence? Awareness, do you always feel that you can ask what the goal is without worrying that maybe you might be the only one out of the loop? I know what the goals are. Do you always feel that you can raise the red flag when you need to, it's positivity, without being considered negative? Sometimes people do, sometimes people don't. So in 1999, um, Amy Edmondson uh, was working at Harvard and she created a paper called Psychological Safety and Learning Behaviors and Work Teams. She was not the first person to study psychological safety, but she was one of the first people to explicitly look at its effect on teams and in a professional context. Um, she defined psychological safety as a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. When I first read that, I really struggled with these two words, punished and humiliated. Because I knew there were very abusive organizations out there. There are organizations out there that these two things exist in very large quantities. But I also knew they were not the organizations I was researching. You know, most organizations, thankfully, aren't rife with punishment and humiliation, in my view, are they? Managers don't really punish their employees. You know, you get in the store cupboard for 30 minutes and think about what you've done. We failed to sprint. Doesn't really happen, hopefully. You know, I can just imagine humiliation, uh, the whole team laughing at some de poor developer that admitted they didn't know what the most recent NoSQL database to drop this week was. And what I came to realize was that actually, while you can't observe it necessarily, this is talking about a personal experience. This is not me you know, watching a team and going, oh yeah, it's that person punished that person, or there's some humiliation. Sometimes you can, sometimes it's more overt. But generally, this is about it feeling like punishment. It feeling punished. You know what? If you do, if you are, if it is your fault that you failed the sprint, and you get overlooked for that promotion, well, that pay rise might feel like punishment. If you do raise your hand up and say, I don't know that particular Java framework that we're all meant to be using, or that NoSQL database, or that web server platform, and the team tell you to go RTFM and get on with it, you know what, if that's done in front of the team, that could be pretty humiliating. So let's, uh, let's look at how some of, the, some of the places where this is also important. So one of the chaps I spoke to was a guy called Phelan McDermott. He's an uh, Olivier Award-winning theatre director and has worked with improvisation for over 20 years now. Um, he told me about this thing called yes and, or the yes and muscle that he talks about. So yes and, so who here has seen an improvisation show, like a theatre show? or has ever done any improvisation? Okay, so I'll explain a little bit first. Um, so in improv, specifically improvisational theatre, generally you have a group of performers on stage who will deliver a show or a scene, normally without, generally without any preparation at all. 
um, a lot of the time they will get a little bit of input from the audience. You know, oh, which room am I in? Where are we? And the audience say, you're on a spaceship and you're flying around Jupiter. And I go, okay, great. And they'll say, and there's a cat on board. Okay, I've got a cat, fine. And, uh, and the cat is pregnant. And you go, okay, fine. So it's a story about having kittens in a spaceship around Jupiter and the performers will just work it out. Um, and what's interesting is, is that with Yes And, what happens is, is that you, if you can imagine, this group of performers don't have a script. So the only way for them to put on a show and to produce some sort of cohesive narrative from the little snippets of often deliberately contrived and challenging uh, input they might get from the audience, or sometimes no audience input at all, is to listen to one another. So the first step for those performers will be that someone will make an offer, as it's known. So one of the performers will get an idea from the audience. Here's something, or just have an idea. And they'll start by beginning to present, doing something. So it might be they walk through an imaginary door on stage and say, Honey, I'm home! And alas, I'm lacking another performer at the moment, but hopefully the other performer is going to listen to that and think, Okay, so... Uh, and this is the yes portion. So I'm going to think, okay, so what, what are they really telling me? Okay, so honey, I'm home. I guess I could be a wife or a partner or something. I wonder what this story is going. So the next one, what I'm going to then do is, is I've listened to that, and then I'm going to add my bit. So I might think, okay, let me think, what am I going to do? All right, yeah, I'll, oh, I'm just in the shower, darling. I'll be down in a minute. And then I, hopefully, a story will somehow continue from that. Um, it could be like Psycho, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're not, maybe they're not the husband. Um, but I'm sure we'll learn. <laughs> so, what's important here is that I didn't block that story. That story was allowed to develop and to flow. What they need to make sure they're doing is they pay attention to their fellow performers to make sure they're actually listening to the offers being made and not creating an environment that stymies creativity. Now, we are going to do some exercises in a second. So what I'd like you to do is think about that statement. Think about what we're talking about with yes and. Thinking about accepting ideas without judgment. And think about the next time you're in a meeting and you're collaborating and you're listening and working with your peers, you're problem solving together. And think about how that might change the dynamic of that meeting. So to begin with, could everyone stand up please and you'll need to find a pair. So everyone on your feet and find a partner. Um, so it's it's even better if you don't know them, but don't like walk around trying to find someone. Whoever's nearest is fine. Um, now what I'd like you to do is to stand opposite one another like this, and one of you is going to be reflecting the other. So one of you is a mirror. So if you stand opposite like this, please. And what I'd like you to do is to begin to move very slowly, and one of you is the mirror, so you're going to reflect the, mo the movements of the other person. Now. What I'd like you to do is, ideally, in silence, <laughs> um, but laughing's okay, um, is attempt to try and swap over who is the mirror and who is not. And you need to do that without uh, me necessarily being able to tell who's the mirror and, who's, being ref and who's, who's in control. So work out how you can do that. I'll give you a minute. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's a, a one of many improv warm-up exercises, ex exercises that I will chuck in. Um, it's always a very good idea. And for any of you that are regularly facilitating uh, meetings and retrospectives and things like that, they can be fantastic energizers. So now we're going to do an exercise called String of Pearls. <laughs> So this is a storytelling exercise. So what we're going to be doing is telling a story together. So the story is going to begin here, and it's going to end over here. 
So what happens is, is I'm going to invite a volunteer up on stage to tell the beginning of the story. So once upon a time, there was a lunatic on stage giving a talk. And the end of the story, uh, hopefully not this time, although this was the end of the story <coughs> in Nashville at the beginning of the year. And he was dragged out and beaten to death in a back alley. Uh, thankfully, that didn't really happen. That was just the story they told. And it turned out, thankfully... Uh, to be some, you know, some annoying person in the audience with a mobile phone that got dragged out. So the story ended happily for me, at least, uh, but make sure you turn off your mobile phones. Um, so what I'd like is, what we'll then be doing is, is once, if you imagine, what we then start with is we know where the story will begin and we will know where the story will end, but we won't know how we will get there. And we're going to then iterate on this story and volunteers will come up and add in bits of the story, wherever they feel they can contribute. And eventually, we will have, yeah, I will, <laughs> eventually, I will, I will, we will have a line of individuals up on stage who will be telling a story that will be beautiful in its own way, but we'll see how it develops. So, I'd like to get a volunteer, if possible, to begin the story. Uh, that's okay? Sure, I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're not off, you're not off the hook yet. So, can I get, can I get a volunteer? And who's willing to try and kick off the story? This is the the single most terrifying bit of this session for me and you. <laughs> um, but if I can have a volunteer to come up, once upon a time is the, I'll give you the first few words. Anyone? Any ideas? Oh, there we go. A round of applause. Do you want to come straight up? So if you can stand sort of here, I think, is a good spot. You're all going to get completely blinded by the projector. But So if you, here's the microphone. So if you use the mic and just say, want, say the beginning of your story, if that's okay. Once upon a time in the forest. Oh, there we go. I like, I like some nature. <laughs> All right, so how is the, how is the forest? We've got, a, we've got a scene now, so where are we going to go? What, how is this story going to finish? So I want to know the end of this story. What's the last line of this story? It starts, once upon a time in the forest, and how's it going to finish? Does anyone have any ideas? Come on, this guy's really lonely. He needs some help. Any ideas? The end of the story? Yes. Fantastic, thank you. So if you can stand, yeah, do you want to grab the mic and just say your line and then we'll reread re -read both okay. of you. So. And trolleybus has stopped. What did you say? Trolleybus has stopped. Trolleybus. What's trolleybus? Oh, bus has stopped. The bus has stopped. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my, I, yeah, my, uh, Thank you very much. So if you reread the reread the line. So once upon a time in a forest. <laughs> and the trolley bus has stopped. Okay. So we've got a bus stopping. <laughs> um, and we're in a forest. So all I know right now is we have a bus and a forest. I think we could do with potentially some human characters or animal characters. Who's, anyone got any ideas? So how are we going to fill in the gaps to this story? Any ideas? <laughs> that wasn't me dictating that you come up. That was me just suggesting. So <laughs> there was this group of lost school children okay. in the forest. Oh, God. It, it's getting quite dark. <laughs> um, so there we go. Uh, so reread the line. Once upon a time in a forest, there was this uh, group of lost school children. Thank you. <laughs> and the trolley bus has stopped. Oh, okay, so the bus stopped. We've got a group of small children, oh dear, <laughs> in a forest. Okay, um, so now I'm just pleading, please could we all rescue the children, please? I'm hoping the, the bus didn't just, at the moment, there's a group of kids, the bus stopped in the middle of a forest. Uh, any ideas? What are we going to do with these kids? What did you say? Come up, come up. <laughs> so if you just join the line wherever you fit, and then... Uh... And the children are going to have a picnic. The children are going to have a picnic. Okay, so let's... Is this, is this still on? Is this on? Yeah. Oh, it is on. There we go. Oh. Once upon a time in the forest, there was this group of lost school children. <laughs> who 
came for a picnic. <laughs> and the bus has stopped. <laughs> okay. So I, I want some tension here. Why is it important that the bus stops? I don't know. Maybe they, uh, maybe they were running to try and get the bus. Please, please take me away. Maybe there's some danger. Give me some danger. I don't want to hurt them, but give me some danger. You know, we need to care about these people. So what, what's going on? Yeah, go ahead. I might regret asking for danger now. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, while they were having a picnic, they have uh, a phone which uh, was going to uh, die soon because of lack of the battery, and they had a choice, either to take amazing pics or to call for help in the middle of the forest when, <laughs> when they're lost. I, so the tension was entirely based on whether or not they could Facebook their friends or whatever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I like that kind of danger. Sorry, go ahead. Once, at a, once upon a time in a forest, there was a group of lost school children who came for a picnic and they did not know whether to take pics or to call for help <laughs> with the dying phone. <laughs> and the bus has stopped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the dying phone, they went for a picnic. They're potentially stuck in the forest. What should they do? What are they going to decide? Do we take selfies or, uh, or, or save our lives? I don't know. It, teenagers, their, their priorities can be a bit screwed up, so who knows? <laughs> who knows? So what are, what are they going to decide to do? How are we going to get them out? Go ahead. <laughs> so they decided to take some pictures, but there were no reception in the forest. There were no? Reception. No Wi-Fi, no internet. No oh, internet. God. We need to fix the, uh, the Wi-Fi connection, the, the, the connections in this place. Once upon a time in a forest, <laughs> there was a group of lost school children who came for a picnic. And uh, uh, their phones were dying and they didn't know whether to call for help or to take pictures. So they decided to take pictures, but there were no reception. <sighs> and the buzz has stopped. <laughs> I, I feel like there is still some uh, narrative gap here uh, between, between the story that we might need to fill. So do we have any ideas? How do we get to the bus stopping? Maybe it stopped at school. You know, maybe they got on it. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe it was all a dream. <laughs> Go ahead. And then the angry jeer has come. <laughs> so go and join the line. <laughs> <laughs> I'll grab that. <laughs> I've got some danger. Once upon a time in a forest, there was a group of lost school children who came for a picnic. Their phones were dying, but they didn't know whether to take pics uh, or to call for help. They took some pictures, but there were no reception. <laughs> and the angry deer came to them. <laughs> <laughs> and the bus has stopped. <laughs> Okay, so the angry deer, that, so now there is genuine danger. How are we going to get from the angry deer to the bus stopping? Can someone finish this, this thing? Now, we, we genuinely have a group of children in actual mortal terror of being consumed by the only uh, carnivorous deer in the Lithuanian forest. Um, let's, uh, so how are we going to end this? Any ideas? Do you guys have any ideas? Any ideas? Oh, we have an idea. All right, here we go. <laughs> and right at the very moment when the angry deer was taking the phones, <laughs> the bus <laughs> hit a hole and Johnny woke up. <laughs> <laughs> so let's... Uh, I'll grab it. There we go. Once upon a time in the forest, this might be the last time. So An with amazing energy. group of lost <laughs> school children came for a picnic. Their phones were dying, but they didn't know whether to take pics or to call for help. <laughs> they decided to take pictures, but there were no reception. <laughs> and then the angry deer has come to them. <laughs> and at the very moment, as the deer was taking the phones from the children, the bus hit a hole and Johnny woke up. <laughs> 
and the bus has stopped. And they obviously went we on to enjoy their picnic. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. So I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first question, did we tell a good story? Yeah? Was it a good story? I thought it was pretty good. I, I, I tend to rate the scale somewhere between, you know, Oscar-winning Hollywood epic and, you know, uh, two or three-part Netflix miniseries. So I'm not sure where we are on the range, but I think, I think we could get a few episodes of Netflix out of this. Um, was it an engaging activity, both people watching and people taking part? Do you find it engaging? So why, why do you think we were engaged? Anyone have any ideas? Yeah, it's fun. So what, what's interesting is, is there's two elements to it. Um, there is one element, which is that we love stories. Human brains, we've been telling stories, uh, you know, since before we could really speak. We used to grunt and draw things on the wall. Um, and this is something that's completely innate to us as human beings. Um, but not only that, is that in this session, <laughs> It was safe to contribute your ideas without embarrassment. It didn't really matter what you were saying. You could say whatever you wanted. No one's being laughed off stage. No one's being, you know, sorry, no, that, that, that won't work. We just worked with what we were given. We just accepted the offers that we were given from each person that chose to, to give us some ideas. Everyone also had complete autonomy on their contribution. Um, you know, I'm not picking people and going, you, idea, you've not said anything. What are you doing at the back? Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting where there's potentially some tension, the servers are down, the manager's stressed because his manager's stressed and his manager's stressed and everyone's shouting at each other and at some point in the meeting you've been a bit quiet and the manager says, you, you've not said anything, do you have any ideas? I'm sure that was the single most creative moment of your career. <laughs> so it's also safe to fail. Um, you know, we did or didn't, I mean, I've done this exercise a lot of times, and the story isn't always great. But interestingly, well, firstly, the exercise is engaging regardless of the quality of the narrative. Um, but also, everyone's actually learning. So the outcome of this exercise, and, and I call it a storytelling exercise because that's technically what we're doing, but it's not what we're learning. What you learn when you take part in this exercise is listening and observation. You learn to listen to your fellow performers and to work out how to collaborate together and how to tell a story. Um, interestingly, I'm on stage sort of <sighs> greasing the wheels, so to speak, of this exercise when I'm here. If you Google String of Pearls, you will find hundreds of experienced <laughs> improv groups doing this exercise without any MC, so to speak, helping to coordinate things. Um, and they're fantastic. They tell excellent stories. They're very funny performers. Um, and they weren't good when they first started. So they will have had plenty of times when the stories they told fell on a quiet audience that wanted some comedy and didn't receive it. But every time they do it, they get better. The outcome is learning, not necessarily a story. So, after my own research and the various conversations I had, um, I also kind of came up with my own definition, which is an extension of what was there to give it more clarity to me. So, in my view, you're safe when you can speak your truth, raise your concerns, and give and receive constructive feedback without humiliation, rejection, or punishment. So, if you were to go, uh, no, sorry, I'll, I'll skip that bit. <laughs> we're running out of time, so. Interestingly, like many of the things relating to Agile and a lot of the work that we try to do, there, to really have agility in an organization, it is far more about mindset and the way you approach the problem than the practices that you employ. There are plenty of people, I'm sure, who are doing 
Scrum, and they are very much doing Scrum and not necessarily achieving agility. And this is the same with psychological safety. When we want to try and get it, it it's interesting that I've seen and worked with a number of teams since I started looking into this and very explicitly focusing on psychological safety and how to build it. Um, but the most common thing that I see in teams is that I will see a team that to me is very obviously unsafe. There are very obvious problems in the way that the team is working. But they don't, they're not aware of it. If you speak to them, they'd say, yeah, we're safe. I like my peers, I get along with my manager, it's all fine. And that, that really puzzled me. Because <laughs> I could see that they weren't actually collaborating. They weren't really communicating. People weren't saying they didn't know when they needed to say it. They didn't know what the goals are, and no one was saying they didn't. <laughs> so I really like to focus on awareness in the first instance. So this is what I call paying attention. So paying attention breaks down into three areas. At the first level, you have experiential. So this is actually teaching yourself to become aware of how you are. How safe am I feeling right now? Do I feel like I can contribute? I felt like I could contribute, and now I don't. What happened? What changed? Why do I feel less safe now than I did? And this could be described as a, as a mindfulness practice. Those of you that, that practice any kind of thing around mindfulness will see that. To me, it's, it's far more focused than that, but it's definitely related. Then at the next level, we have extrinsic safety. So this is when you're comfortable with your own sort of self-awareness, and you can expand that awareness to the people that you work with every day. This is the individuals that you see day in and day out that are on your team. And this means you just being curious. Oh, that's interesting. Those two were working together, or they were, they were contributing in the meeting, and now they're not. I wonder what happened. Then we have environmental. So environmental breaks down into two areas. The first level, we have the organization. So this is the organizational environment. Now, this is generally policies in the organization that affect the level of safety that a team feels or an individual feels. This is often seen, unfortunately, and HR get a bad rap, but this is often policies that um, come out of HR, and there'll be things like bonus schemes for the engineer that produces the less defects this uh, quarter. That always works really well. Um, and unsurprisingly, that doesn't help collaboration particularly. Um, or even bonus schemes that individually measure a single person's contribution to a project. If you're measured on your individual contribution, then you don't do a huge amount to share that contribution with others. And then you have the person. So this is, this is your life. Could I could you raise a hand? Do you put out your hand if you have a life? <laughs> I'm glad. A few people haven't got their hands up, which is a little worrying. Um, we might have a zombie invasion, so you probably want to watch your back when we, uh, when we leave the room. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, a somewhat inconvenient reality that we have to work with human beings, despite Amazon's work on Alexa and other AI improvements. We... Um, you know, well, Alexa's not really a viable employee just yet. <laughs> um, thankful to some. We have to work with humans, and human beings are messy and broken and chaotic and, un and not particularly dependable, and they screw up, and they have lives like children and parents and spouses and stuff. And a lot of the time, that stuff, regardless of your organizational policy or how unprofessional it is to bring your personal life into the office, I don't know about you, but I've never quite found a cloakroom big enough to hang my personal life on when I get into the office. It sort of 
tends to just stick there. Um, that stuff will screw with your ability to work effectively. It will. You know what? If you're up all night with a three-year-old with a fever, you're going to be a bit crapper in the office the next day than you were the day before. That's life. You will be. Regardless of what you say on how well you do without sleep and how well you're coping, you not really cope. Sleep deprivation is, is real. I'm experiencing it right now. <laughs> there is... Yeah. And that's what this is. So... Paying attention. Paying attention is about noticing how you feel yourself, how people around you are, and approaching the people in the organization with curiosity and not judgment. So what does that mean? Sorry, I didn't hang it there for long enough as I was taking the photos of the slide. There was a, a nice uh, story that came out of some of my research while I was visiting a company called Menlo Innovations, uh, which is in Ar Ann Arbor just outside of Detroit. Um, and their CEO, Rich Sheridan, he wrote a book called Joy Inc. that I highly recommend, told me about their general uh, implicitly recognized policy for dealing with what you could describe as unsatisfactory behavior. Pretty much anyone. As soon as someone is behaving in a way that isn't great, they could be a bit short, they could be a bit snappy, they could have been a bit grumpy that day. And the policy is, is you take that person to one side and you say, are you okay? You show curiosity, and dare I say it, empathy. <laughs> Don't run too quickly before judgment. So why does this thing really matter? Why is safety really important? There are many, many benefits in your organization. Okay, there are many, many benefits to introducing safety. Um, and a whole bunch of studies, not least Google, demonstrating that your teams will be more effective if you focus on fostering safety across your organization. And the, you know, your organization will definitely become more profitable if you focus on improving the safety of your teams. But that really isn't what engaged me in this topic. So, Gallup interview 1,500 people every day in the States. They also are known for their much bigger global studies. And they're trying to work out the level of engagement. Two-thirds of employees in America, this is roughly the same across, across, roughly the same internationally. It varies very slightly. Are disengaged or actively disengaged with their work. And these guys, these actively disengaged people, they are actively disengaging the engaged staff. How much of this, this is their definition, having an opportunity to do what you do best each day, having someone at work who encourages my development and believing my opinions count, how much of that do you think is possible without psychological safety? I'll leave that with you. And then another Really, really depressing slide. Again, two-thirds of the workforce in the States, this is from a 2015 study by the American Psychological Association, say that workplace stress, with the workplace is a very or somewhat significant contributor to their experience of, of negative stress. And one in two people say that when they're stressed, they've shouted at their spouse, yelled at their kids, pretty sad picture. So I wanted to know what the relationship was. I, there was many, many, many studies that tell me really obviously and uninterestingly that if you go to an organization and you query and you work with the organization and you study their employees and you find that everyone's really stressed, they're also really disengaged. And that seemed really obvious and not that interesting to me. But what um, Arnold Backer discovered with his job demands resources model, I'm not going to go into it in, a huge de in huge depth here, um, but I do recommend people look it up, is that there is a direct relationship, a reverse, a reverse, the inverse relationship between stress and engagement. So what he shows us, and I'll use a story to explain this better, 
imagine you're in the office, it's 7 p.m., and the manager bursts in through the door. Oh, God, oh, God, guys, um, look, I really need, we, the CEO's coming tomorrow. And you're like, what? And you don't really care, obviously, that much. Sorry, CEO's coming tomorrow, and he says, yeah, look, we need to show him a demo. And you're like, but we started this project an hour ago. And he goes, I don't care. Look, you just need to get something together. And you go, but, and he's already gone. He's charged out the door, gone home, obviously. Made his dinner, had a bath, chilling out. You're in the office. Uh, he's dealing with the stress of that phone call from the CEO, obviously. Um, and you're in the office, and it's now 10 p.m., and you're working away, trying to screw something together. 2 a.m., eventually you finish. You've got 10 liters of coffee in your system, and you get home, and you kind of know that it's going to break pretty much the moment the CEO moves his mouse two centimeters off that button. But you're kind of hoping that it will just about work. But you're pretty stressed, and you can't sleep because you have 10 liters of coffee in your bloodstream. And, um, and you're stressed because you know who's going to get the blame when it doesn't work. It's your fault. You were the one doing it. And then there's another story at 7 p.m. And this time, you're working on that project that you have been waiting for. This is the project. You have been in meetings. You've been planning it. And this is day one. You've just been desperate for this project. There is no manager. He left early. You look up at the clock, and suddenly it's 2 a.m. And you're like, wow, God, where did the time go? And you jump in a cab, and you decide you should probably go home. And you're lying in bed, and your ideas are still going round in your head. And you think, oh, what the hell? And you pick up your laptop, and you work until the birds are tweeting outside, and the sun's coming up. And you walk into the office early, laptop above your head, and go, guys, I've done it. And they take one look at your code and say, that's great, but please never work through the night again. <laughs> Other than that mild disappointment at the end, you're not stressed in that second one. Who's experienced one or both of those situations or something close to them at some point in their career? Anyone? Anyone ever worked through the night, been stressed? Have you ever felt, would you say that you would feel stressed <laughs> in the first option? <laughs> I think most would. So what Arnold Backer discovered was that there is a direct relationship, which is that when you experience engagement, it, it affects positively, decreases your experience of stress. So to finish, safety is the number one indicator of effective teams. And without it, there can be no engagement. You genuinely cannot get truly engaged in your work when when you are uh, not experiencing at least some level of psychological safety. I like to finish on this quote from Ale Belshi. Um, safety is a very profound thing, and not being emotionally abusive in the workplace sure would make the world a better place. Thank you very much. I don't... I don't think there are time for questions. You want to get your lunch, but I'm going to be around for the rest of the day. I'm giving a workshop um, after lunch, um, so feel free to come down to that and harass me. <laughs> but I'm going to be at lunch, so feel free to come and uh, speak to me over, over lunch if you would like to discuss it thank further. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is something you remember oh, thank you. Oh, lovely. Okay.